Hello guys and welcome back to Counter 10. My name is Ani and today we have another practice live arbor demonstration. Joining me today is Abe and I want to thank Abe for doing this fiver. We've done a previous one with Ben just not too long ago. As you guys know, doing these live practice viber demonstrations itself is stressful enough. And with a week left to go before the exam, I want to thank Abe for taking time to do one of these with me. Uh, we're wishing him obviously the best of luck on the day. We're going to keep it the same format as we did last time, which is a one minute perusal and two topics, five minutes each. Uh, so a total of a 10 minute viber. Again, this is different to the viber on the day, which is going to be two minute perusal for the candidates and then a 20 minute topic repeated three times, so 60 minutes overall. So let's go and dive straight into it. Hey Abe, uh, thanks for joining me. How are you feeling a week out from the Viva? Yeah, not too bad. Um, feeling a bit over Viva at times, but um, just trying to push through that last week because you know there's a clear end point now. Um, and yeah, just uh, trying to keep the confidence levels high. Yeah, I'm sure you'll smash it on the day that uh, viva fatigue really does start to keep creeping with especially a week mm -hmm. to go you just want you just want your viva to be now and you're ready to go probably look i think you'll be doing really well and we're going to just keep it really simple today you've done vivas with me in the past so we're just going to do one minute perusal a 10 minute viva two topics if you're ready to get straight into it i'll start my one minute perusal now <clears throat> and your opening question is how is general anesthesia different from sleep? So I'm just going to repeat that. How is yeah. general anesthesia different from sleep? So you have roughly 45 seconds left. Mm So hello there, candidate. My name is Arnie. Do you understand the opening question? Yes. Great. Can you tell me how is general anesthesia different from sleep? So they're both reversible uh, forms of loss of consciousness. However, general anesthetic, um, will you will not be able to be roused by a verbal or a tactile um, stimulation. And also uh, uh, anesthesia is drug-induced. Yeah, good. Uh, tell me, do you know of different types of sleep? Yeah, so you have non-REM and REM. Yeah, and what is the difference between non-REM and non-REM uh, sleep? Uh, so non-REM occurs uh, first in the sleep cycle, um, followed by REM. Um, and REM is, uh, they, they both have uh, different sort of physiological um, changes that occur in the body um, and uh, different restoration sort of purposes. Yeah, good. You mentioned a sleep cycle. How long is a normal sleep cycle? Uh, for non-REM, um, it's broken up into different stages. The overall would be, uh, I think about 30 to 120 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. where REM is about 15 to 90 minutes, I believe. Sure. Probably less. Yep. Go on. Mm. Um, um, yeah. How so much, go on about, yeah. Yeah. How much of our sleep out of that is, uh, REM and non-REM? So if you had to break it down to percentages, how much is REM and yep. how much is non-REM? Uh, I would say the majority would be non-REM, yeah. um, long duration. However, um, yeah. Very good. So you mentioned, mentioned some stages of non-REM sleep. What stages are you mm -hmm. aware of? Uh, there's four stages in non-REM. Yeah. What so are you those? have stage one. Uh, so it occurs sequentially, chronologically, I should say, stage one to stage four, um, as you get deeper into the sleep cycle. So um, they, stage one is um, associated with differences in terms of if you were to monitor the electrical activity in the brain uh, with EEG, um, you get different waveforms that occur as you progress down the stages. Yeah, so what waveforms would you see going from stage one to stage four, say if I attached an EEG to your brain as you went yep. from awake to sleep? 
So stage one, you would have um, theta waves present. Um, and then stage two, you'd have theta waves with sleep spindles potentially. Stage three would be delta waves with sleep spindles. And then finally, stage four would be uh, majority would just be uh, delta waves. Yeah. Are you sure you see theta waves in stage one? Mm, it's probably be beginning to see them. Um, you would have um, uh, a larger proportion of alpha waves as well compared Ooh. to an awake pet. What frequency are alpha waves compared to theta waves? Uh, alpha waves are a lower frequency. Uh, they're between... Um, Oh, so beta waves are greater than 20 hertz, I believe. And alpha waves are, oh, I'm going to say 12 to 20 hertz. Yeah, good. And theta waves? Uh, theta waves would be um, 8 to 12. Good, good. Okay. And uh, So moving on from the non-REM stages of sleep, do you know of any different stages in REM sleep? I believe there's two phases. Yeah. Um, what are those? There is a, um, I'm not exactly sure which one goes first, but I believe there's a tonic and a phasic phase. Yeah, good. Say I took off an EEG monitor and I wanted to see if you were sleeping using clinical signs. What signs could I use to see if you were sleeping? Uh, clinical signs in terms of like attaching monitoring, like say heart yeah. rate or... Yeah. So in, in REM, you have an irregular uh, respiratory pattern. Um, potentially with an increased respiratory rate. Um, you would also have uh, increased heart rate. Um, mm. And other clinical signs would be that you could actually potentially see the eye moving and not in, in, in REM sleep. Yeah, good. So now I attach the EEG monitor back onto you, but this time you're now under a general anesthetic. How do I tell the difference in EEG between someone that's under a GA versus someone that's sleeping? Uh, so in a general anesthetic, you'll have other waveforms that you might not have sleeping, such as burst suppression. Mm -hmm. Um, if the anesthetic is, uh, too deep, potentially, um, you won't have sleep spindles, I believe in a general anesthetic. What are um, sleep spindles? uh, sleep spindles to my knowledge are high frequency, um, waveforms, uh, that are part of the normal uh, sleep cycle in terms of disinhibit or in sorry inhibition of inhibitory neurons. I believe I'm so. You're getting excited. I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to talk about a different topic now. Yep. What is the normal blood glucose in a fasting patient? Uh, three point five to five point five millimoles per liter. Okay, sure. Say we give this fasting patient a bolus of food. How do they? Yep. How does their blood glucose go back to that normal range? Uh, so you have um, two particular hormones that are important in this um, um, regulation of blood glucose. It's um, insulin and glucagon. Yeah. So as you t um, as you have a yeah after a ingestion of food, you'll have an increase in your blood glucose levels um, as you've um, absorbed it systemic into the systemic circulation. Uh, this will then be sensed in the uh, pancreas, uh, specifically by the beta cells. Um, this will release insulin to allow the glucose levels to f um, fall to a, a more normal or normal range. Good. You men mentioned some sensors being the pancreas. Are there any other sensors of glucose in our body? Uh, another pancreas is... The majority, um, I would say the liver, but I'm not exactly sure. Good. Anything else in the brain? Mm, I'm not sure. That's okay. Minor point. So as insulin is released from the pancreas, where is insulin stored within the within the pancreas? Uh, it's stored it's stored in the beta cells in the islet of Langenhans. Good. And what is the mechanism of its release? Um, in terms of the cellular mechanism? Yes. Uh, so you have, um, uh, trying to remember now, I think it's, so it's, it's depolarization essentially, which results in exocytosis of the insulin through the vesicles. Um, so you have to have an increase intracellular calcium, um, mm. to achieve this. Uh, and this is, I believe, um, yeah, so yeah, depolarization of, 
the cell. I can't remember the exact mechanism. I'm, I'm going to have to say, yeah. That's okay. Minor point. You mentioned that insulin, we, we said that insulin would be increased when glucose levels are increased. What other yep. stimuli do you know of that cause insulin release apart from blood glucose? Um, I believe you also have, um, Ooh, no, I'm not sure. I think cortisol probably wouldn't be one. Um, are you sure about that? Yeah. I'm just trying to think like stress response would increase insulin. So I guess, yeah, cortisol could, um, yeah, it would potentially lead to increased insulin. Yep. Um, ACTH, I mean, that's basically cortisol um catecholamines as well yeah what about types of food what would they do to insulin types of food um in terms of carbohydrates yeah what other types of food do you know of? proteins lipids good what do you think they would do to insulin they would also increase its um good. secretion yeah. what, what inhibits insulin release um, so if you have, um, a low blood sugar level, Good. if you have, uh, or oh, what would inhibit glucagon as well. So not quite, that's I a minor point. Yeah. What, what's the endo endogenous half-life of insulin? Mm, endogenous half-life, uh, it's it's quite short. It wouldn't be very long. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure of the time. That's all right. So how does insulin increase the uptake of glucose by cells in the body? Uh, so you have insulin-dependent um, um, transporters. Yeah. Uh, it can be found in uh, the muscles and also the adipose tissue. So these are GLUT4 receptors Good. Uh, or transporters, I should say. Um so, yeah, they need insulin to allow glucose to be uh, driven into the cell. Yeah. What other type of GLUT receptors do you know of? Uh, you have GLUT1, which is in the brain. Yep. Uh, these, these are insulin independent. Um, and you also have GLUT2, which is found in the liver. Again, uh, insulin independent. Yeah. And what type, of, um, what type of diffusion is this using the GLUT receptors? Uh, it is a... Um, Ooh, it'd be a facilitated um does it, require, yeah. does it require any energy it it uh it would yeah so it's active facilitated perfect and we'll stop there that's 10 minutes mm. how do you feel yeah see i'm a bit scratchy on the um I, it's always i don't know one of those topics until i've read about it so much but i just always seem to forget it for some reason yeah. um yeah endocrine's always one of those ones where a lot of the topics i just find that i can't really produce a good vibe in all the time yeah i seem to forget things but yeah that's what it is <laughs> yeah i feel like endocrine is one of those things it's one of those rote learn vibes unfortunately um yeah what's one thing that i think you, what's one thing that you think you did well and what's one thing you think you could have improved on mm, i think i've kind of got this in feedback previously like if i don't know something just just tell them to, you know you can either give it a quick stab if if you have a rough guess if not just say you don't know just to move on yeah if it's not a critical question, like if it's a critical question, then yeah, you should probably try and think about it. Give yourself some time um, to take a breath and just think about it. Um, but if it's just like a minor kind of thing that they want to know about and you don't know, then you just kind of move on quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what's um, one thing you think you could have improved on apart from that? Mm. Uh I'm not sure, but you probably, you could probably tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think um, uh, we've obviously done Vivas previously in the past, and yeah. the obvious non-technical thing that I think was pretty easiest easy to see was the mm. way you answered questions, and you made a <laughs> concerted effort, whether you done it deliberately or not, was give short, sharp answers and let the examiner yeah. take you. And I think we've discussed this in the past. You can either have two approaches. If you're really confident, you can ramble and talk and give an answer to something, but then you go down the rabbit hole of have I given the right answer to where the vibe is going and have I lost marks and wasted time? Um, and I think you've chosen the other approach, which is give the answer that they're asking for. And if they want more detail, the examiner will ask for that detail. Um, yeah. And I think that's definitely a safer way to do it. 
And it's mm -hmm. also uh, a way that you can kind of be led by the examiner, which some examiners will probably like to do. Um, with that, yeah. um, you need to categorize with that. Yeah. And I think, and I think um, questions such as uh, the endocrine vibe, I don't really lend itself to categorization really well, but categorization yeah. is key um, uh, to be led down. Because if you don't mention it, they can't say something for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the actual technical viva, so these vibas are again, I have a habit of giving vibas that aren't really core topics, but can be linked to core, to core topics. So mm -hmm. the example being, would you get a viva about anesthesia and sleep? And would you get a viva asking about cycles of sleep? Probably not. You know, if, mm. you, go by, if you go by averages, it's probably a really low likelihood. Has there, be, has there been questions about sleep? certainly um and so is it fair game yeah it's in the curriculum uh do i expect you to know in-depth knowledge about sleep no i don't i expect you to know the basics which is no non-rem from rem i kind of let you off the hook a couple of times you you gave a good definition of general anesthesia but you probably gave a subpar definition of sleep yeah yeah which again is opening question is not meant to be any qu marks given it's supposed to make you feel comfortable which I think was mm. fine. If I wanted more details, I would have just asked you and I didn't really care yeah. too much because you showed that you understood what general anesthesia was and which is fine mm. for me. Yeah. Um, it's a roughly a 90 minute cycle, which is sleep. If you, if you go into technicals and roughly mm -hmm. um, 80 to 90% of your sleep is REM sleep and uh, sorry, non-REM. And then the remaining yeah. is REM. Um, and that yeah. differs between neonates, adults and elderly. Of course. Um, the waveforms that are probably the most important. Um, so just run me through your waveforms again in terms of how they go mm -hmm. from most highest frequency to lowest frequency. Yeah. So the highest frequency is beta waves. Yeah. Uh, and you go, so they're, they're um, traditionally like, uh, I think greater than 20 hertz. Um, mm -hmm. You also have gamma waves, which is like very, very high frequency, but I think they're not always talked about when we talk about sleep and stuff, not really that important. Yeah. Um, Beta than alpha, so alpha is like eight. Oh, sorry, um, is twelve to twenty ish. Yeah, so this is where we kind of let you off the hook. Beta mm. is divided into high beta and low beta waves, and yeah. they refer from wave frequency. Like it can be twelve to thirteen hertz up to like thirty five hertz, and oh, okay, high frequency beta or high beta is things that are above twenty, and low frequency beta is like twenty two. 12 yeah and then yeah, we get gotcha. into alpha which is 12 to 8 uh then uh we get into theta which is 8 to 4 and then delta yeah. which is essentially 1 to 4 um well, yeah. So yeah we just missed the low yeah. frequency yeah like in terms of the ranges i think i was i was one off basically wasn't i yeah mm. and again it's a minor point but if someone's vibing you on sleep they probably love the sleep topic so they want you to know that yeah but that's yeah. not where this viva is really important. And I think that's the key thing to get out of this because what the viva was important about, yeah, you knew the waveforms. Like, yes, you got it a bit wrong, but we talked about the non-clinical, I mean, the clinical signs of telling someone's asleep. So you knew the heart rate changes, the respiratory changes, and you were quick to that. But I think the real key was knowing how a waveform in an EEG would look for someone who's got under a general anesthesia versus someone mm. who's sleeping. And there you mentioned the key things, which was a burst suppression. I don't think you mentioned isoelectric wave, but you mentioned burst suppression. You mentioned the sleep spindle. And the other things you could mm -hmm. mention was a K-complex. So K-complex and sleep spindles are mm -hmm. unique to a sleeping person. Yeah. And yeah. burst suppression is unique to a general anesthesia and isoelectric waves are unique to a general anesthesia. And I think mm -hmm. that was the key in this viva that I had constructed could you yeah. differentiate the EEGs between and that showed that you had understanding um if we had time we would then talk about you know i think the fairness of this viva is that mm. this viva could easily skip from being about sleep to just being about waveforms and going and linking yeah. that to bis yeah of course yeah um, and i think this would be a very fair equipment question equipment viva to get and then we'd talk about different kind of Drugs that affect BIS, what are the factors that affect BIS, you know, when is the BIS unreliable and how does the BIS actually work? And yeah. so that would be a very fair viva. 
that would link into this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you feel hearing that? Yeah, no, that make that makes all um yes, that makes sense, yeah, everything you said. Um, in terms of the glucose, blood glucose viva, that, yeah, so we talked about it at the start, but it's really a rote land one. And it's one of those things you just, you just go back and you have to just look at it because mm. the number one question is why are we asking any of these questions in a viva? And a good understanding of insulin can be pretty well defended by most people. Um, they can say as an examiner, well, we fast patients all the time. So therefore mm. we need to know how insulin and glucagon work and we need yeah. to know the triggers that cause insulin, exactly where insulin works, exactly the type of receptors that it works on and a really good understanding of these things. And then we manipulate people by giving them insulin infusions if they've got high sugars and stuff like that. So it's a drug that we commonly give as well as the fact that we're commonly making patients into a fasted state. Um, yeah. So that's the defending of why this father was asked. In terms of your answers, you had the good answers about senses. So hypothalamus is the other one that we missed, yeah. but pancreas and liver. Yeah, and liver being a main glucose stat. And then although you didn't know the specifics about how insulin release is gets released from the um, uh, beta Langerhans cells, you knew yeah. that it involved calcium. You knew that it involved some kind of de depolarization of the cell. And you said the key word, which was exocytosis. Um, yeah which is all the main points, you know, the specifics is, yeah, uh, glucose goes into the cell, it gets made into ATP, ATP blocks okay. potassium ATP channels, causes the depolarizing of the cell, so calcium influxes, calcium oh. binds to vesicles that have stored insulin, and that causes exocytosis of insulin. Um, the triggers of insulin release are a bit tricky, but they're things like amino acids, fatty acids, Glucagon okay. is actually a trigger, and that's a trick question. So glucagon is a yeah. trigger for insulin release because it's, again, yeah, yeah. yin-yang balance. Um, yeah, it makes sense. But you had good understanding because you showed, like, oh, it's a stress hormone like cortisol. In, in stress, we have ins increased insulin release. So cortisol will be a trigger as well. And mm -hmm. what inhibits it is, yeah, low BSL and exercise um, and then other drugs like somat uh, and other substances like somatostatin. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot, yeah. Um, insulin is not very long half life because we have to recreate it all the time. So it's like a couple of minutes in terms of endogenous half life. Um, and then we talked about glue receptors. And again, we could have gone and talked about different types of diffusion. So uh, your active processes versus your passive processes being passive, not requiring energy. So simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active requiring energy. And they can yeah. be co transport and um, other things like exone and endocytosis. Um, so that's kind of the gist of that. And again, it's a pretty dry viva. I think mm. you covered all the main points, um, but your technique of answering quickly and having short, sharp answers, I think was a key to get through the viva really well. Mm. Uh, do you have any takeaways now that you heard some feedback? Uh, no, I think I agree with all your points. Like you said, um, I think, yeah, just trying to be short, snappy, just answer the question really. I've had, and when I was doing vibes early on, I was rambling a lot and, you know, I could see that you can kind of just sense a bit of a, a loss of confidence with the examiners when you do that. So you just want to just be short, snappy, answer what they've actually asked and just mm -hmm. leave it like that. Let them direct you where they want to go. Yeah. And I think, um, your comfortability in this setting and also will bode well on the day when it's a, you know, different environment and it's a bit more stressful. Yeah. So yeah, I want to thank you for doing this because I know it's not the easiest doing a live practice fiber demonstration. No <laughs> it's something that I'd be very nervous doing as well. <laughs> so I want to thank nah. you for doing that. All good. Um, and wish you all the best of luck in your Viva next week. And so yeah, uh, good luck next week and thanks to everyone listening. I hope you guys get something non-technical and technical out of this. And again, good luck to you, Abe, next week. And I know you'll smash it and get the result that you want. Cheers, mate.